There once was a man who lived among mountains. All his life he dreamed and investigated dreams and legends. He studied other countries, other cultures and other ages. He was a traveler, a scientist and a scholar. His dreams have changed our ideas. His name was Carl Gustav Jung. My dear friend, Dr. Young, I receive your always welcome letter. Indeed, I am very glad to hear from you. What I told you the day we was top the roof, you understand me correct. And also, I will tell you more that you can write in that book. For the traditional Indians, the mythology is part and parcel of their whole social system. <clears throat> they don't just believe in myths, the myth is their culture. Their way of life is their myth. The Swiss psychologist Carl Gustav Jung spent the early part of his working life investigating the personal unconscious through dreams. But he devoted the second half of his career to researching what he called the collective unconscious, which connected people of different cultures at the deeper level of dreams, ritual, religion and mythology. The author, Count Nikolai Tolstoy. It would be very hard to explain, it seems to me, for the universality of certain myths, which repeat themselves and sometimes in, in um, or very often, in uh, strikingly similar detail in very different um, cultures and societies. And I don't see how that could be explained unless there's something springing up, so to speak, from uh, universally within men, which Jung gave this um, term, the collective unconscious. The concept of the collective unconscious is absolutely essential for understanding Jung. I can't say it was his invention, but it was his discovery. The collective unconscious is that set of building blocks from which human reality is made. And it's as if there is this great reservoir outside of time and space, patterns, energy. Mankind struggles to give it definition like this, from which everything is drawn or everything is made. Jung observed a lack of meaning in the lives of his patients and in modern European culture in general. He studied mythology, legends, fairy tales, and religions in many languages to see what they shared and what European culture lacked. In 1925, Jung set off to visit the Elgoni tribe in Kenya. His companion was the English psychiatrist Godwin Baines, who had worked in Zurich as Jung's assistant. Together, he and Baines filmed their expedition in search of psychological discoveries. They trekked for weeks through the highlands of Kenya towards Mount Elgon. Their African destination was an extreme contrast from the Europe of the 1920s. Jung was fascinated by primitive societies in which mythology and ritual defined the role and meaning of the individual person's life. Jung was 50 and white-haired. The African tribesmen honoured him with the title Mzi, or Old Man. They were as fascinated by the white European doctor as he was by them. He had learnt some Swahili, and as always, he asked everyone he met about their dreams and the importance they gave to dreaming. Dr Joe Wheelwright. His visit to Africa certainly helped to inform him on the subject of dreams and to differentiate between what he called big dreams and little dreams. And this had to do with whether the dream was from the collective unconscious, from the deepest layers, or whether it was from the personal unconscious. Because a big dream came from the collective unconscious and was really universal in its import. 
Jung's expedition party spent six weeks living among the Elgonyi. In conversation with the elders of the tribe, Jung asked them about their religious practices and their dreams. In particular, the Swiss doctor of medicine conferred with the Labon, or medicine man. He answered with tears in his eyes. In old days, the Labons had dreams and knew whether there is war or sickness, or whether rain comes or whether herds should be driven. But since the whites were in Africa, he said, no one had dreams anymore. The divine voice which counseled the tribe was no longer needed because the English know better. Our camp life proved to be one of the loveliest interludes in my life. I enjoyed the divine peace of a still primeval country. Never had I seen so clearly man and other animals. Thousands of miles lay between me and Europe, mother of all demons. In traveling to Africa to find a psychic observation post outside the sphere of the European, I unconsciously wanted to find that part of my personality which had become invisible under the influence and pressure of being European. Jung's journey to Africa was his longest and most dramatic adventure into unknown psychic territory. The distance and the difference of cultural patterns gave him a sense of perspective on the civilized Western psyche. Jung had first visited the United States with Sigmund Freud in 1909. Three years later, his reputation in America growing rapidly, Jung was invited to visit St. Elizabeth's in Washington, D.C., then, as now, the principal psychiatric hospital in the United States. He wanted to discover where the black patients there had the same sorts of dreams as white Europeans, a question no one had ever asked before. Unlike the men and women at St. Elizabeth's today, the patients of 75 years ago had never been asked about their dreams. When Jung talked to them, he found that the dreams, fantasies and artwork of Negro patients reminded him of his European patients' dreams, and that both contained ideas and images found in ancient mythology. In all probability, the most important mythological motifs are common to all times and races. I have, in fact, been able to demonstrate a whole series of motifs from Greek mythology in the dreams and fantasies of purebred Negroes suffering from mental disorders. Back in Switzerland, Jung put his observations to use in the work to which he always returned, that of healing the psyche. Through my acquaintance with many Americans and my trips to and in America, I have obtained an enormous amount of insight into the European character. On my next trip to the United States, I went with a group of American friends to visit the Indians of New Mexico, the city building Pueblos. Jung visited Taos Pueblo, the oldest settlement of the Pueblo Indians. The Pueblo tribe, like the Hopi, the Navajo and the Acoma, are one of the many tribes of the Anasazi culture, whose original homes are now ruins, like the White House in the Canyon de Shea in eastern Arizona. These oldest inhabitants of North America are farming peoples whose history, mythology, religion and calendar are all interwoven. Their tradition is one of living close to the earth and the elements, attuned to the seasons, related to their gods. For them, the earth is mother and the sun father. In 1923, Jung visited New Mexico and went with friends to Taos, anxious to know more. Dr. Joe Henderson. He was very impressed by a medicine man he met there called Mountain Lake, and he always liked to repeat what Mountain Lake had said, that the, the Americans were all crazy because they think with their heads instead of with their hearts, the way the Indians do. Mountain Lake shared with him the, the, the Indian religious view that uh, their, their rituals uh, 
help the sun to come up every day. And that without, without their help, uh, the sun would, start, would stop coming, coming up. And uh, that piece of information and the meeting of a living embodiment, a representative of such a way of life, struck a very deep chord in Jung. Mountain Lake was the English name of Okwia Biano, a Pueblo elder who talked to Jung about the tribal life of the Taos Indians in the 1920s and about their traditional religion. His granddaughter, Martha Suazo, still lives in Taos and has preserved the letters which Mountain Lake wrote to Jung later. My grandfather was uh, Bieno, uh, Blue Lake Mountain, and uh, also known as uh, Antonio Marival of the Taos Pueblo tribe. He was a member of the Taos Pueblo Council, and uh, he lived here until he died. My dear friend, Dr. Young, many moons gone by since I hear from you. I've been thinking of you many times to write to you, but I lost your You know, address. you corresponded with a lot of people, and, and as a child, uh, I was always over at his house, and I would see some of the letters that some of the people would, would write to him. My dear friend, Mountain Lake, it was very nice of you indeed that you wrote a letter to me. I thought you had quite forgotten me. I often thought of you in the meantime, and I even talked of you often to my pupils. Are your young men still Sometimes he would be sitting sun? there. He had a big Are table. Um, it was a dining table, but he used it for a desk, you know, and he had all his, his uh, boxes of paper and, and whatever, you know, and he would be sitting there sometimes writing letters to people. Ten years after our religion is destroyed, the whole world will see that we have been working for the whole world. As I told you, our great father, the sun, is the one who supports the whole world. And that's our duties to help our great father, the sun. I really don't know maybe to what depth he told young, but uh, he, he made an impression on him, and Dr. Yon made an impression on my grandfather. My old Pueblo friend thought that the raison d'etre of his Pueblo had been to help the sun to cross the sky. I envied him for the fullness of meaning in that belief. That was my grandfather's philosophy, that if our Taos Pueblo Indians stopped practicing their religion. He said, give or, uh, or take 10 years that the whole world would end. After all, that's what's keeping this world going. In 1963, Jung's grandson, Dieter Baumann, also an analyst, followed in the footsteps of his grandfather to Taos to meet the elderly Indian who had had such an impact on Jung. It was very moving because, I mean, uh, 40 years before, uh, my grandfather had met him. And uh, he could remember very well and uh, uh, showed me that they had talked there on the roof uh, with each other. And I, f I found him a very, a very fine man, a very special man. He was very intelligent and uh, he had a very soft face, also very human, profoundly human, I think, had a very deep feeling. We do feel with the heart, or think with the heart. See, Mountain Lake said, how cruel the whites look. Their lips are thin, their noses sharp, their faces furrowed and distorted by folds. Their eyes have a staring expression. They're always seeking something. What are they seeking? The whites always want something. They're always uneasy and restless. We do not know what they want. We do not understand. We think that they are mad. For the first time in my life, so it seemed to me, someone had drawn for me a picture of the real white man. This Indian had struck our vulnerable spot, unveiled a truth to which we are blind.
Indian religious rituals have two main forms. Ritual dances to honor the gods and to assist in the successful progress of farming and harvesting, and chants by medicine men. The chant can last as long as nine days and is used for healing both physical and psychological illness. In Taos, Jung witnessed ceremonial dances like the eagle dance. To the Pueblo Indians, the eagle and the buffalo are both sacred animals. Religious traditions dictate that eagle feathers must be used in ceremony and ritual. So the tribe thanks and honors the bird by imitation. also saw Indian rituals. The main message from the Indians was, for me, the respect for the earth, the religious attitude towards the earth. They are really in touch with the spirit of the earth. Lily Salvador is a traditional Indian potter in New Mexico. That rock was left here for my mother, by her mother. She had used it to grind either corn or what I did was grind the pottery shards and our clay on there to make it real fine. The shards are from in the hills. When we take a hike, we find them and we bring them back because they're used back into our clay, used as a temper. So it's an old and a new pot put together. What Jung and Bauman both encountered was a culture where religion, history, ritual and mythology are fully integrated. The new clay is uh, found at a secret place. Only the potters know where to get it. And there's no road to it, so we just have to carry it on our backs. I don't think if anybody else, like, um, the Anglo or anybody else, if they learned how to form the pot, they won't have that feeling of the clay or just the touch of our ancestors there. The pots themselves are not merely decorative. They tell the history of the Akama tribe's search for their promised land, the high mesa of Akama, known as Sky City, and claimed as the oldest inhabited settlement in the United States. The story of the long journey to the Akamas tribal home is passed down the female line, and the potters are always women, who give the story expression in the traditional form. The design here represents how our people had traveled a long time ago. It was told to us that they had traveled in a circle, always looking for a place that was ready for them. In our language, Akama means a place that was ready, or the promised land. And the lines represent your rain. It rained on them. And right here is your sun. And it's coming out of the cloud here. The myth of the Akama people reflects the everyday reality of many of the Indian tribes. Wherever there is rain or water of any kind, there can be agriculture, food, and survival. But the tribe is not only at the mercy of the elements. Its traditions also bring the elements into harmony. Lily Salvador's pots require the clay earth and fire to set them hard. But they also need the life-giving water and air as well. That's what we always have in mind, is moisture. After I finished making a pot, 
I'm told to blow into them to give them a heart or their own spirits. And down at the bottom, when we draw our first line, we are told not to close it completely, and that brings in the spirit. The spirits of my ancestors are there. Jung's meeting with Indians was brief. But like his contact two years later with the African tribesmen, he encountered a society for whom mythology was the religious explanation of their life and origins, expressed in story and ritual. Jung was quite sure that man is not complete without a living mythology or religion. Unlike his European patients, tribal people had a sense of meaning to their lives. Ochwer Beano told him that through the ritual, every morning they made the sun come. If they didn't come, the sun wouldn't rise anymore and it would be the end of the world. He realized that people have to live their own myths. And uh, it was important to him that they were related to something important, were related to something uh, greater than themselves, and that is all that matters. He found uh, similar uh, instances with, uh, with them and with others, and uh, this made him believe in the all presence of the unconscious, the collective unconscious. In his travels and studies, Jung saw mythologies as the expression of the collective unconscious. When stories, images or symbols appeared in similar form but in different cultures, he called them archetypes. These represent a common human inheritance of patterns of thought and action or basic psychological instincts. It is quite certain that uh, man is born with a certain functioning a certain way of functioning, a certain pattern of behavior. And uh, that is expressed in the form of archetypal images or archetypal forms. For instance, the way in which a man should behave is given by an archetype. Yeah. And therefore, you see, the primitives tell that stories, uh, a great deal of education goes through storytelling. He thought that scientific industrial man was suffered great psychic distress and frustration because the religious side of our nature was repressed. Jung was trying to speak to that, to bring it forward. According to the Jungian tradition, uh, our religions are produced something like works of folk art. Religion is the heart and center of culture, and it's through religion that we work out a common vocabulary of rituals and symbols, which together makes up a kind of house of meaning that we dwell in, our particular vision of the universe, of human life, of human personal relations, and so on. In Africa, Jung sat with the Algoni men as they told their myths and stories. For instance, they call in a palaver of the young men and uh, to older men perform before the eyes of the younger all the things they should not do. <laughs> yeah. And the answer say, no, that's exactly the thing you shall not do. Another way is they tell them of all the things they should not do. They tell them, and you should, like the decalogue, thou shalt not. Yes, yes. And, uh, and that is always um, uh, supported by uh, mythological tales. For instance, our ancestors have done so and so. Uh, uh, and so you shall do. Yeah. Or such and such a hero has done so and so, uh, and uh, that is your uh, model. Yeah. In Greek, you know, there was a Theseus, there was a Heracles, uh, models of fine men, of gentlemen, you know. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and they teach us how to behave. They are archetypes. I see. I archetypes see. of behavior. 